Hello and welcome to Chapter 3 of the Bankers Leadership Series in association with SWIFT on Constructing the Future of Payments, where the discussion has moved on to the importance of standards and interoperability. So Vikesh, I was going to turn to you first. How important is standards and interoperability um, for the future of payments, do you think? So I think it's fundamental, and I think it's fundamental for a few reasons. I think through the move uh, to ISO 20022, you, you have the building blocks um, for three key areas. One, for enriched data sets. Secondly, to have those data sets in a structured form. And thirdly, the interoperability point that you just mentioned, the ability for data to be transmitted both across uh, geographies, but also within an economy, within a market, in a transparent, known way that people are able to interpret that data, know the business function behind a data element. As we move towards you know, um, instant payment schemes being more universally adopted, the need for that data to be truly ubiquitous and known and allow for smart kind of interpretation and overlay services, I think is fundamental. But obviously there's still challenges that remain. Um, Victoria, Paul, I was going to ask you sort of how is the industry really coming together to solve them? The data is incredibly important for the industry, but the more that can be done to harmonise it so people know what information they should be sharing when, it's really important. The Bank of England are working very closely with Paul and his team at Pay.UK looking at ISO 20022. 2018 we had a consultation going out to the industry thinking about how to take that forward. Listening to the industry all the time, what information do you need in that? We're going to work jointly and have market guidance to try and harmonise as much as possible in the UK. You also need to think about global harmonisation. But I think there is a lot of work for the industry to be ready and it is really important that everybody is ready at the same time. So there's definitely a kernel of the ISO 2022 message for the UK from the core credit message perspective. But when you get to structured addresses and other information, there are different requirements of different parts of the market. The challenge for us is to make sure that the structure of the message evolves with what the market wants, mm. coming from a really secure centre that we can then deliver reasonably quickly through both of our developments, but allow the market to develop over time and get the benefit of data. I mean, the opportunities that we're talking about in terms of interoperability, but also data to feed things like <coughs> artificial intelligence or more fraud screening or more behavioural screening is crucial to giving customers the benefit as much as the banking institutions the benefit. Okay, well that's what I wanted to turn to is really, Marco, maybe I'll start with you first, is you know, how can banks really see the benefits uh, that ISO 2022 brings? When, when I look at uh, real-time payment rollouts over, let's say, the last 15 years, it used to be once every couple of years that we get a new scheme somewhere in the world. It's now this year three to five mm. alone. And in fact, on, on, on a bank car scale, it's not many a weekend where there isn't some functionality that's going live, an incremental uh, development on a real-time payment platform uh, somewhere in the world. So if I was to wave a magic wand, and it's a very big magic wand, if every payment scheme was the same, it would be very advantageous to us. Um, we'd have the same standard that we develop it everywhere. But actually, an element of standardization helps not just us. It helps the, the, the fintechs, the, the little t, the big t tech companies that are providing solutions, not just to ourselves, but all banks and payment providers. If there's an element of standardization, it removes cost from the system. It makes it easier for them to support innovation by providing platforms that are cheaper to use, but also very helpful in, in our clients' aspect of seeing what's happening within their own companies, um, massively improving their efficiency and security as well. I'm really all for, for standards, but I think standards need to be looked at as more of a framework within uh, that people work within. So there is that wiggle room to be able to innovate very quickly. I get very concerned that we, we all agree up front what a standard actually looks like, by which time the actual market moves completely, the technology behind that's moved completely, and we say, oh no, we need to catch up again. So you don't actually deliver anything, you kind of end up just trying to play catch up this whole time. I agree, the big magic wand kind, I like that. But, um, I think you, I'm also a realist, that's not going to happen. Or, or definitely not even within my so lifetime. Same here, I'm also a realist. <laughs> that it's, that it's so I, I kind of say, so as long as you've got some sort of framework, and Vikeshi's point around data dictionaries, I buy into that completely. If you've got the same data dictionary, the same framework underneath that, the technologists in the room, they will actually start solving how you can make that a lot more interoperable. 
Um, and that's not, you know, that's not a hard thing to do once you've got the standard from the framework in there. But if you start rolling out too much and get too standardized, you get bogged down in the governance process of it all. Um, and then we don't go anywhere. So there's a balance between completely dictating it up front and, and everybody has to do the same thing, which, which can tend to uh, stifle a little bit, but you do need to have a framework around which everybody, uh, everybody operates. I think with ISO 20022, um, for a bank such as ourselves, we've got a great opportunity to standardise things internally, but we're not underestimating the amount of work that's required because data is the key here. It flows through all of your systems, all of your channels, back into your ledger, and don't forget the customers as well because they need to make changes themselves. But what it does give then is the opportunity to use that data much more effectively, whether it's in terms of fraud detection, whether it's in terms of just predicting customer behavior so that you can support them more going forward uh, as well. So it, it really is a, a time of transformational change, both in terms of our infrastructure as an organization, the central infrastructure is helping to facilitate that, but the key role is making sure that those standards are well understood, but don't become stifling. At the risk of becoming the voice of reason for a second, and to echo the point that Victoria made, all of these good things that we're talking about and exploring all hinge on the adoption of the standard itself and the data elements. And I think we do have to stay focused on that and the level of effort uh, that's needed across the industry and across global institutions who are multi-jurisdictional. And you know, for SWIFT, we have a four-year coexistence period, which recognizes the time length that all of these migrations are going to be happening. In chapter four of this five-part series, we'll be looking at baking in resilience into the new infrastructure.